Welcome to another video for Tibbins Education Services and Tutoring. I'm your host, Ryan Tibbins. Today, we're going to be talking about the Virginia English Writing SOL, uh, focusing on the multiple choice portion of that test. Now, this video is going to be kind of a quick overview, hopefully quick, uh, just talking about some testing strategies that students can use to help them navigate the multiple choice portion of that test a little more efficiently, a little more accurately, and certainly with a greater degree of confidence. Okay, the, the number one thing that you can do to improve your performance on a standardized test, particularly multiple choice standardized test, is to take the test a lot. So if your teacher has and already been doing this with you in class, uh, you know, going through practice tests and things like that, you can just Google Virginia Department of Education English EOC uh, writing SOL uh, or some variation of that. Uh, a bunch of previous multiple choice tests are available online with answer keys that you can use for your practice. I strongly recommend that you use a few. Now, before you do too much practice, though, what's important is to make sure you're practicing the right way. This video is not actually going to teach you much content at all. I'm going to point to a few punctuation rules and things like that. Generally speaking, I'm going to give you the tools you need to take the test better. Okay. I'm a big believer that if you have the foundational skills, you know, the basic literacy, you know, writing grammar skills that you need here. Um, and the thing we really need to do to boost the score is to just use the right strategies. In my experience, uh, my students, you know, where maybe they've taken the test or a student for another teacher took the test and then comes to me for some tutoring and extra help. Students who do nothing different, we don't review any content, they just use these strategies, see usually an average of somewhere around 25 to 30 points improvement. So that's, that's a big jump. You know, if you were to take the test and you were going to say fail it, you know, you need a 400 to pass, let's say you're going to get a 390. Just by using these strategies, you should see a passing score. If you're already scoring pretty high, then these are the kind of strategies that can push you over the hump to a perfect score or to at least get you into that sort of advanced range. Uh, now, a lot of these strategies are also going to be useful for you on other standardized writing tests. Think SAT, ACT, some things like that. For those, you need to make some modifications because those are timed tests. You have to move a little quicker. But what I'm going to talk about today is focused on the SOL, which is an untimed writing test. Okay. Now, remember, the test comes in two portions, okay? There's a multiple choice test, which is what we're talking about right now, and also an essay portion where you'll have to write a short persuasive essay. I have a few other videos available on this YouTube channel. Make sure you check them out and like and subscribe and all that good stuff. Um, but you know, check those out to learn the process for how to attack the essay. And also there's a video about breaking down all the prompts. I also read all the prompts to you and explain what they mean and how you can respond. But right now let's look at the multiple choice, okay? And again, the, the goal here is not to do like a thorough run through of all of the grammar and how to make an outline. You know, we're not worrying about all that right now. This video is very specifically, what do we need to do to score better on the test just by being a better test taker? Okay. And so that is ultimately going to be our goal. Um, make sure I'm pulling this up here right for you. Um, all right. There we go. Uh, so now, this is obviously a uh, low contact information. So if you're interested in additional support for your uh, SOL preparation, maybe for SAT, ACT, or my specialty college admissions essays, you can uh, hit me up through any of these any of these methods, facebook.com slash Tibbinsest, on Twitter at Tibbinsest, or by email, mrtibbins at yahoo.com. You also leave a comment here on YouTube, and I, I try to respond to those uh, when, when possible when I see them. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into this thing. So today we're talking about the writing SOL multiple choice strategies. Now, again, these can be used for any of the writing SOL multiple choice tests, uh, you know, elementary, middle school, but really, you know, I teach 11th and 12th grade English, so we're going to fo focus on the EOC or the end of course 11th grade test. Okay. Um, so here you have your first tip cheat. No, I'm joking. Don't cheat. Don't do that. Um, any indication of potential cheating leads to what's called a, a test discrepancy um, or abnormality, depending, you know, testing abnormality. And then you, at minimum, have to take the test again. You can run into other problems, other problems for your school as well. Um, also, why cheat when you can do it right on your own? And that's what we're about to work on, show you how to do it right on your own. So here's the basic process you're going to use for how to take the test. And then throughout this, this quick video, we're going to go through, I'm going to break these down, explain what they mean. But first, you preview passages, you preview and annotate the questions, you read and annotate each passage. Uh, always keep test visible with the questions. It's sort of an organizational 
foundational piece. We're going to talk about process of elimination and something called Occam's Razor. Talk about how to narrow down and sort of focus on the right issues in grammar and punctuation questions. And then I'll give you a, a quick look at uh, eight good punctuation rules that cover all the issues that will pop up on this test. I also have separate videos on this channel. Uh, one about just punctuation introduction, why punctuation is important and a better way to think about it. A uh, video about commas and the five comma rules. A video about semicolons and the two semicolon rules and a, uh, a video about colons and dashes, which really just comes with one rule. Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward and simple. And I strongly recommend you check those videos out as well, particularly if you're not real confident in your punctuation. But these are the, the topics or sort of the, the strategies that I want you to employ when you take the multiple choice portion of your writing as well test. First thing you do is preview the passage. I'll be honest. The first thing I recommend is actually preview the whole test, right? You know, just see, see what's in front of you. Uh, every couple of years, they'll, they'll make minor modifications in the number of passages, the length of the readings, how many questions. Uh, I think this test uh, for the last few years has been about 45 questions. Usually they score it out of 40 and then there's five field test items. But in the past, that number has been a little bit higher. Uh, I think when the first test first started, it was a little bit lower. So First thing I recommend you do is use the drop down menus to navigate at the top of the screen and test nav and see how many reading passages are there. Go to each one. Just click through the questions. You don't even have to read them. Just see how many questions am I being asked? How many passages? What are the long passages, hard passages, whatever? Um, and a nice strategy uh, that I should recommend on the reading SOL that you'll see in May is sometimes you do the longest or the hardest passage first while your brain is fresh. On the writing test, that's not as important. Most of the passages aren't that long or that complicated. On average, you know, we never know exactly what we'll see, um, but I, I don't think it's as important here. But if you're worried, you know, oh man, you know, this is really hard. I'm really stressed. Or if you know you're tired, you didn't get good sleep the night before, then, you know, by all means, um, you know, do do the what looks to be the hardest section first while your mind is fresh and, and while you're the most focused. Save the easy stuff or the short stuff for the end. So if you're a little tired, you're a little bored, you can still get through that. Okay. Um, again, that's more important on the reading test, but it, it can it can work on any any standardized test with reading passages. So, you know, then, then, so we go ahead and we start, you know, whether you're taking the test in order or you're going to tackle a different section first, the first thing you do is preview the passage. So read any directions that are available uh, at the top of the questions, you know, you're working with a split screen. So look at the directions with the questions, look at the direction with the passage. Sometimes they'll give you little hints about what you're looking for in the reading or what kind of thing you're reading. Make sure you look at the title, see if there are any section headings, you know, if it's blocked off into chunks. Um, what are those, what are those words? Are there any images or pictures, what we're trying to do is activate what's called background knowledge. Anything that I might know about the subject would be helpful. Now, some of you are thinking, it's a writing test. Do I really need to know anything about the, the passages? No, not necessarily. However, when we're more comfortable with the text, we tend to answer more accurately and more confidently. When I get a passage on something I already know a lot about, I'm more comfortable reading it. I'm familiar with some of the vocabulary. Um, and then I don't second guess myself as enough. When I read something, you know, I'm looking at a passage and I go, I don't know what this is about. You know, I, I don't know anything about this. By, you know, I mean, it's just natural. You get a little nervous, you get a little cautious. You feel like you don't understand things, even though maybe you're doing just fine. And so I always say you want to preview the passage just to get a sense of what am I getting into? What kind of text is this? Is this an outline? Is this a draft of a student essay? Is this a published work? You know, are they just throwing me, you know, in some cases you're going to have passage-based questions. Sometimes like for some of the punctuation stuff, it's just going to be a sentence on the screen. You're just going to get that one sentence and you answer in, in response to that. What you want to do is see it. You need to see the test, right? Uh, you can't answer what you don't know and, and you can't know something if you haven't had a chance to interact with a little bit. So, you know, take a look. What's the title? What do those directions say? Get any useful information available. Simple. Then I recommend that you actually read the questions and annotate them very lightly before you read the passage. Um, some of you are like, read the passage. Like some of you are already thinking like, oh, come on. Like this is a, a writing test. I'm not reading all the passages. I'm just reading the piece that, you know, the, the question's about. And, you know, I have a strategy to help you with that. You can get away with that a little bit. We'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, but I, I really do. You know, if, if your goal is to score really well, or if you know this is going to be hard for you, and you're like, I'm not confident, I've been struggling in English class, or, you know, whatever the issues may be, um, you know, give yourself the best chance possible. Preview the questions and then read the passage. So when I say preview the questions, what does that mean? Read the question. Okay. Notice the last thing on the slide here is do not read the answer options. Just look at the questions. Okay. What you want to do is underline the keywords and phrases. So if it says in line 32, hi, use the highlighting tool on the screen and highlight line 32. You know, the, the main idea of the sentence is that blank or, you know, um, 
the the author should move lines three to and then they're going to decide you know three to which other place in it highlight move lines three you know highlight that make sure that you see it test nav saves your highlights that you put into the program so you can go through question by question highlight key phrases you get a sense like okay what is this about oh you know the, you know, look for those sections of the reading that that maybe have more questions maybe you're like wow there's a lot of questions in the first 15 lines, and then there aren't as many until the end. It doesn't mean you skip it, you don't read the middle. It just means that when you go and read the passage, you read that part a little bit more carefully, okay? Nothing nothing crazy here, just you wanna make sure you know what are they asking me about, what am I looking for, and are there places where I need to slow down or be a little bit more focused? Again, you do not read the answers before you read the test. And this is for any, any test where you, you preview questions. Um, if you're fast, this is a great strategy on the SAT and ACT, but you gotta be quick because those are time tests. The SOL, you can take all day. Literally, you could take all day and, you know, it, it, you're not done until the school day ends or until they kick you out. Um, you know, but if you're fast, you can also do this on those other tests. Um, you, you read all the questions and you say, OK, now I know what they're asking me about. The reason you don't read answer options is, let's say for the SOL, they give you four answer options. Only one of them is right. OK, and you don't know which one it is yet because you haven't looked at the, at the passage or the sample sentence or whatever it may be. So you read all four thinking all four of them have an equal chance of being correct. Three of them are wrong. You just put all this junk into your head that's going to distract you, throw you off later on just because there's one good one in there. So what I say is don't read any of them. You just read the questions, go through, highlight some keywords, go back and read through the passage. As you're reading the passage, you're gonna do a little light annotating there and you're gonna mark things that might be useful. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So we've annotated or highlighted keywords from the questions. We have not looked at the answer options because we don't wanna be distracted. Now we go and read the passage, okay? As you're reading, you take very light notes. Um, I recommend that you use the highlighting tool on the screen where if you read something, you're like, hey, I think there's a question about that or that is useful information to me, just highlight it. If you want, you can make a little note, you know, write something down, but just highlight it. Don't stop the reading and go try to answer the question. The reason is that back and forth breaks your, your train of thought, it breaks your focus. And so I go and I answer that one question, but then I have to go back and resume reading. And in, in that transition, I probably forgot something. And so now the transitions don't sound right, or I forget exactly what they're talking about. I say, if you're going to read the passage, you just keep reading. The only breaks you take are very quick, short ones to highlight key text on the screen or possibly to write something down. This is one of the best strategies you can use on any reading activity. If you're being asked to do a writing multiple choice test that has a reading passage, if you're doing a reading multiple choice test like the, uh, the reading SOL in May, SATs, ACTs, your teacher hands you a worksheet and you know, whatever it is, as you're reading, give each paragraph a title. If you get a little tiny one, you know, one sentence uh, you know, paragraph, just think, does that fit better with the paragraph before it or after it and just include it there? If you can give every paragraph a little like two to four word title, that's a pretty good indication that you understand what you were reading. If you read a paragraph, you get to the end and you go, I have no idea what I would call that. That means you either weren't paying that close attention, your mind wandered and you don't know what you read or you did read it, but you didn't understand it, which means, hey, I should read that again. Now we've all done that thing where we read the whole passage and you get down to the end. You're like, I have no idea what's going on here. You know, you're reading a book and you, know, you get to the bottom of the page, you're about to flip the page. You're like, I don't know what I just read. It's because you were reading with your eyes rather than reading with your brain. Uh, I always ask students, you know, what's the most important organ for reading? And you know, everybody impulsively responds, eyes. You know, but blind people read without their eyes. You know, they use Braille. The most important organ in your body for reading is your brain. And a good way to make sure that your brain is engaged in the reading, not just your eyeballs, is you stop once in a while and you write down a note. Information's going in. Once in a while, I stop, swish it around, and something comes back out. And if I can't figure out what information needs to come back out through my pencil onto the paper, then I didn't understand that part. And rather than read big chunks and then realize, oh, crap, I don't know what happened. I read a paragraph, I make a note. I read a paragraph, I make a note. It will slow you down this much, but it will increase your accuracy this much. OK, great strategy. Uh, so that's it. And by the way, I recommend you do it on, the, on your scratch paper. Your teacher should give you or your test proctor should give you a blank sheet of paper and a pencil. So as you're working, you, know, you say, all right, at the top, I put passage one. I'm reading, I do P1, paragraph one, and I put the title. And for each one, title, title, title. Later on, when I go to the questions, I read a question, I go, hmm, what part would that be in? Like if they don't give you a line number and you go, what part would that be in? Rather than have to reread the passage, I look at my list of titles and I say, 
That question most closely relates to which of these titles, and I find my spot. I can navigate the text easier. I make sure that I'm, I'm comprehending and able to recall the information. Um, can't stress it enough. It's a great, simple strategy to boost your performance on things like this. You give each paragraph a title, okay? Now, if, notice the last note here, if you're skimming or rereading, you always read in chunks of three. This is another really important testing strategy that will help you in a lot of places in addition to the SOL. Um, if you need to go look at the text to answer a question, you should never read fewer than three sentences. So even if you're like, I'm not reading the whole passage, I skimmed a little bit, now I'm doing the questions and I'm just, I'm going, it says line five, I go find line five. Cool. Cool. But what you really want to do is make sure you have appropriate context to help you answer the question. The way we do that is we find the part that they're talking about. So maybe it's a sentence that's in lines five and six. I go, okay, cool. I look for where the sentence before it begins. So I'm back up in like line three, maybe. I read that sentence, the sentence they're asking about, and one more sentence after it. By reading a chunk of three sentences, I can make sure that I put the information into context. For the writing as well, sometimes that's important. Like if they do pronoun antecedent agreement, I don't know who he is if I don't look in the previous sentence. I don't know what it is until I find that. Um, sometimes with punctuation issues, I don't know if information is essential or not, thinking like restrictive and non-restrictive phrases and clauses. I don't know if I need commas or not, unless I know how much information the author thinks we have. And the way I can make sure that I'm answering these questions accurately and confidently is have a little context to back me up. You reread in chunks of three. You never read fewer than three sentences when you're doing a test like this, okay? That's a big one. So give each paragraph a title, reread in chunks of three. Next, uh, keep the text visible with the questions. This seems simple, but uh, you know, you're gonna be working uh, in, a, in a text. Uh, well, the screen that you're seeing here, the, the screen, um, clipping at the bottom here. I think that's actually the older version of the test. I think they've updated the format just a little bit, but essentially you're going to have a reading passage and, uh, and, and the questions, right? Sort of side by side. Make sure that you're advancing the text when you advance the question. Okay, so I answer question number two. I go to question three. I go, oh, hey, I know that one. I don't need to look at the text. So I just answer it. If it includes a page number, a line number, a section, whatever it is, I advance. Even if I don't need to read the text, I always move them together. The reason is that sometimes you'll get a few questions in a row where you're like, I know these. I don't need to look. I know it. I'm feeling good. I'm confident. That's great. But I get a few questions ahead, and then I hit a section and go, ooh, I don't know. I got to go back and look at line 20. Well, my text is still at the top, so I have to scroll down, find line 20, figure out what's going on there, reread a chunk of three sentences, and then I go back to the question. Well, now I have to read the question again because I didn't remember it because I had to scroll and find my spot and then I'd go back. It's, it's really, really easy, but every time you advance to the next question, if the text should move, move it, okay? They, they need to be moving together. It's really simple, but it, it helps you to stay focused. And for those of you sometimes like, you know, you get a little disorganized in the test. If you're the kid who like sometimes scan, you know, copies in the, fills in the wrong bubble on a Scantron, um, or sometimes you, you answer questions out of order, accidentally skip things. A great way to avoid that, or at least reduce the chances it happens, is you advance the text when you advance the question. Make sure that they always match, even if you don't need to reread. Simple enough. Now, here's two really, really good, really important strategies to help you out. First uh, is just to think about process of elimination in general. The basic way that process of elimination works is when you read a question, and then you go and you look at the answers, you go, okay, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's, it could be any of them. I don't know the answer. If you don't know, then you have, you're almost always going to engage in process of elimination. If you read the question, and you're like, I think I know the answer. And then you look at your multiple choice options. You're like, oh, there it is. That's what I was thinking. Choose it. Move on. You don't have to read the other junk. They, you had an answer in your head you were confident in. They have the same answer available. Pick it and go. But if you go, I'm not sure, or I really don't know, it could be any of them. And what you want to do is read with this, read the answer options with this strategy. There's going to be an answer that is completely wrong. If you read the passage and you understand even most, you know, most of it, not even all of it, you're like, I get most of it. There's going to be one answer option that you will automatically eliminate. And I want you to use the, the cross out or the strikeout tool, you know, and, and X that thing out, right? Get, get rid of it. Um, it, it, if it doesn't look good to you, you know, uh, I have a, te I have a, a former coworker who used to tell students slash the trash, which is a really, really good way to put that slash the trash, get rid of that completely wrong one. Then there's going to be another answer where it's going to be like related to the question, but it's wrong, or it's related to that part of the passage, the reading passage, but it's wrong. Or, you know, 
the question asks about fixing punctuation and you see an answer option where it's an improved version of the sentence, but it doesn't have any of the punctuation or something like that. It's related, but it's wrong. We should usually be able to eliminate at least two. In most cases, you should be able to eliminate two of the answer options. Even if you're really not sure to begin with, I go back, I read the, the sentence again in a chunk of three. You know, so I read that whole section. I go, okay, what, what's left here? A lot of times you're going to narrow it down to two and you're going to have a pretty good answer. And then you're going to have the right answer. And sometimes we get stuck. We go, I don't know. You know, and, and what do we do? Well, we've got a few options. You, you flip a coin or, you know, you just guess randomly. Okay. You know, in theory, if you did the, the process of elimination part, right, then you gave yourself 50, 50, but I think we can do better than 50, 50. Okay. Uh, and by the way, if it's a total blind guess, don't do the coin toss. Um, this is a good SAT strategy. It works for most standardized tests where things are normed and the answers are all approximately even. Um, when you look at it and you go like, okay, I don't know, it could be any of them. You do what's called letter of the day, where you just say, okay, today my favorite letters are B, A, C, D. And you do your process of elimination first. And you get rid of anything else. And then you go, I don't know, it could be any of these. I really don't know then you pick B, or if B was eliminated, you pick A, and, and then C, and then D. And the reason we do that is because it increases the chances that you will actually have a 25% chance of getting it right. Um, when you just randomly choose, um, I, and I'm not a math teacher, so, you know, but um, statistically speaking, when you choose randomly on each question, you actually decrease the chances that you're going to get 25% of them right. If you pick the same letter for every question on the test, you're going to get 25%. Right. Um, and so be consistent. But we want to avoid that. Right. We want to avoid the total blind guess. If it happens, use that strategy. But first we do our process of elimination. Now we narrow it down. So notice if I can eliminate, um, you know, two of the wrong answers. Well, now I have to guess between two of them. I have a 50 percent chance. Now, rather than flip the coin or do your letter of the day at that point, here's what I recommend. You use something called Occam's Razor. Uh, and I'll probably explain this somewhat poorly, but Occam's Razor is this old sort of philosophical concept. Uh, it was, I don't know, it's a few hundred years old. It was uh, invented or, you know, come up with by, the, by a guy who's like the Duke of Occam or something like this. And uh, his idea was that there's beauty and simplicity, that the, the, the most beautiful, uh, best things in the world, whether it's in nature or man-made creations, are the simplest, the things that are direct to like nice clean lines and you know simple simple designs and things like that um you know and people can agree or disagree on the aesthetics but in terms of trying to find a solution to a problem this tends to work the tricky thing is there's no reason why <laughs> like it just it kind of works and no one can really explain it um but i have an idea about that okay and what you want to do is with occam's razor so we narrow it down and let's say we have c and d left I don't know, but they both look right to me. I know one's pretty good and one's actually right, but I can't tell the difference right now. And what you do is you go back, you reread your chunk of three if you need to, and you say, okay, which one is more right? And so what you do is you explain in your head, explain to yourself and say, C, or in this case, it's, lab it's labeled as number three. You know, it's right because blah, 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 blah. Okay. I know why I think that could be right. Now go to the next one. And you say, okay, and this one is right because of blah, blah, blah. The answer with the shorter, simpler, or more direct explanation is the one you should guess. The reason is that sometimes we have the tendency to overthink these things. Okay. And, and we've all done this, by the way, right? You know, we're like, oh, well, I picked my answer and then I overthink it and I want to change my answer and, you know, all this kind of stuff. The answer that you can explain most simply is the most likely to be correct because you might know something somewhere in the back of your mind. You don't even know you know it, but there's something there that's nudging you to say that's more correct. And when you explain the other one, you, what you're doing is you're making it correct. You're giving all this extra explanation, blah, 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 blah. You are working to make that one right. But the one with the short explanation was more right on its own. So when we're answering the questions, if we know the right answer, just pick it and move on. And if you're not totally sure, then you do process of elimination, slash the trash, you know, get rid of the bad options, and you get it narrowed down and you say, okay, why are the remaining answers right? And if after explaining each one, you're still not sure they both seem right, then you should choose the one that was easier or shorter, right? Or more direct to explain. That was the more correct answer. I'm not saying you'll get all of them right. I'm saying you will get them right more often, right? Uh, you can do this on any multiple choice test, by the way, uh, the Occam's razor trick. Anytime you take a multiple choice or a true false test, uh, you will score better if instead of using whatever random guessing strategy you had before, you do the Occam's razor thing where you narrow it down, then explain the remaining options and choose the one with the simplest, most direct solution.
Okay. Um, use it, use it. It's a big deal. It, it, it'll take you a long way on a lot of tests. You'll see all your grades go up a little bit if you just start doing that now. Okay. So that's how we're going to handle our multiple choice questions. Now for the grammar and the revision style questions. Well, what do we do? You know, if it's like, Hey, you know, revise this or which is the best way to rewrite this sentence. Or even if it's a, one of the questions where you get drag and drop punctuation, they give you a sentence. And in between some of the words, there's a little gray box and at the top of the screen, there's a comma in a box and a semicolon and a colon each in their own box. And what you do for those is you drag and drop the punctuation into the sentence where you think it should go using the available spaces. Well, if you look and you go, I'm not sure. The first thing you do for any grammar or revision related question on any test is you find the verbs first. Your verbs are action words. So, uh, you know, run, jump, punch, kick, laugh, cry. They're also state of being words like is, am, was, and were. So, right, like I, you know, I punch the teacher. Don't do that. Punch is the verb. I is the subject. I is the person doing the action. Punch is the action. And then teacher is the direct object receiving that action. Okay. Uh, you don't actually have to know all those terms either, but you do know how, have to know how to find the verb and it would be really useful to find the subjects. Um, and then you say, okay, so I found all my verbs. Then say who or what completed the verb, who or what did the action, the noun or pronoun that you find, that's your subject. The most common grammar uh, item or you know, issue tested on these kinds of standardized tests is subject verb agreement and punctuation. You will do both of them better if you identify the verbs and the subjects first. So in approximately 60% of multiple choice uh, test questions where there's grammar issues, the verb is either the problem or the solution or finding the verb and the subject will reveal to you the way to make the improvement. So if you ever look at a question, you go, I don't know how to improve that sentence or I, nothing looks wrong. I don't know. Before you make any quick judgments or guesses or whatever, find all the verbs in the sentence mark them, highlight them on the screen, and then say who or what did it. Highlight those ones. You now have your subject verb combinations. A subject and a verb together makes a clause, okay? And clauses are like the building blocks of sentences. So any other words that are around, if they relate to that subject or that verb, they're part of that clause. An independent clause, you can put a period at the end and it's its own sentence. A dependent clause is where you're like, well, it's got a subject and a verb, but it can't stand alone for some reason, like, you know, maybe I had the word because or since a subordinating conjunction, or maybe the way I phrase it, it means something really different. If I leave it alone, they're not going to ask you on this test to identify independent and dependent clauses. They are going to ask you to punctuate. They are going to ask you to fix subject verb agreement. So if you can consistently find the subjects and the verbs, you have taken a big step towards improving your accuracy and your general knowledge of functional grammar. Okay. So we find the verbs who, or what does it, then you find your subjects. The first thing you do is make sure they agree singular and plural, you know, he is, they are, and make sure that you don't confuse them. If you see, you know, subjects that look confusing, there's an, and there's multiple subjects or, you know, anything else, read it carefully, figure out like, is it, would I replace that with it or he or she, or would I replace it with they? And then as you try to figure out how do I fix the verb, just substitute the pronoun, makes it much easier. Um, I don't have a video on this yet, but I do plan on making a subject verb agreement video at some point in the future. Uh, and that'll be a big help for anybody who still has tests like this to take, okay? So uh, check on your subjects and verbs and then check the punctuation, particularly as it pertains to the clauses, to the connections of those, those chunks of words, those ideas. Now, punctuation. Um, I have other videos on this. There are four, four punctuation videos are kind of uh, low, low quality, low, low budget productions. Uh, I'll remake them someday. I think I made those uh, early on in the pandemic as something for students to use. Um, Anyway, you can find these rules explained in more detail there. There's an introduction video, which just explains, here's why punctuation is important. Here's a better way to think about it. Then there's a video on the five punctuation rules. There's a third video on the two semicolon rules, and then a fourth video on the one colon rule. Um, I have never seen, I've never seen dashes on the SOL, but they do appear on the SAT and ACT. Dashes function basically like colons in rule eight, or sometimes you can use them as rule two, uh, sort of setting off an interruption and just to add emphasis. Um, but that's it. So you don't have to worry about that for the SOL. Anyway, you can pause the video right now and take a look at the sentences, you know, zoom in and read through the list, or go check out those other videos on this channel for a little bit more detail. Okay, there will be no punctuation questions on this test that cannot be resolved using these rules. So a nice thing to do, and I know it's a little extra work, but if you memorize the rules, okay, so I, I, I won't even look at that part of the screen, right? 
my comma rules are I need commas after introductory words, phrases, or clauses. So introductory pieces around interruptions at, uh, in lists of three or more items um, between multiple modifiers and before fanboys when connecting independent clauses or complete sentences. I need semicolons when I'm connecting separate but related clauses without additional uh, conjunctions helping out. I can also use semicolons as like a variation on rule three uh, in lists where the listed items have their own commas. Colons only do one thing. I have a complete sentence and I can put a colon to attach explanation, clarification, or example of what I've said before. Okay, that's it. That's all they do. And I think I got my list right. I mean, it's my list. I should know it, but um, it's it's quick enough and simple enough that you should be able to memorize these rules. And literally, if you run into a question on the SOL or the SAT or something like that, you go, I don't know. I'm not sure what to do. Use this as a checklist. Does it have an introductory phrase, an interruption, a list of three or more? It's da 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 da. If you answer no to all of them, don't add any punctuation. If you go, yeah, that that's that applies, then you punctuate accordingly. Okay. Um, another thing I should have mentioned with these questions, not so much for the drag and drop punctuation, but some of the revision questions that you'd see here um, and some punctuation questions, uh, you will have an answer option that says as it is. So you'll basically get three ways to change the sentence and then the answer option as it is, which means leave it alone. You do not pick as it is unless you can eliminate the other answer options. Okay. I mean, you'll, you'll choose as it is plenty of times that you, you're going to use it on the test, but you should assume that you will usually be making a change. As it is, is, I don't know what the current math is. I know when they first sort of started formatting questions like that, it was chosen uh, not quite at 25%, the, the rate of the others. So, um, you know, I don't, maybe they fixed that now, but when, when you're taking the test, assume that you need to check each of the other answer options. Well, do I fix the verb this way? Do I fix it this way? Do I do this, this, this? Slash the trash. If you can say, I know that all of these other answer options are wrong, then leave it as is, right? And choose as it is. Um, there you go. So what do we do? You know, I'm done the test. I've gone through the whole thing. Go back and double check the work. If you flagged any items for review or you know something gave you trouble, go back and take another look. You never change an answer unless you can put your finger on evidence though. So as a rule for all tests, well, at least all tests that have reading passages and things like that, you go, okay, I, uh, I you know what? I think I'm going to change my answer. No, you're not unless you can put your finger on something on that screen that you didn't notice before. Oh, I didn't read that right. Right here, I misread that. Or, oh, I didn't see that comma before. Or you gotta put your finger in your own head and you go, oh, you know what? I should add a comma. I forgot about rule four multiple modifiers. If you can't put your finger on an exact precise reason to change your answer, don't change it. Not only because you're probably second guessing yourself, but because when it was fresh, when that information was fresh and you were focused, you picked the best answer you could. It's now 20, 30, 40 minutes later. Why do you think you're going to have a better answer now? If you can point to a reason to change your answer, change it. And if you can't find the exact reason why, it just feels like the other one might be more right. Stop it. Trust yourself. Stick with your first answer. Okay. So you double check all your work. Make sure you followed all the rules. Use this process. Submit your test. and Wait to hear that you passed. Okay. Reminder, you need to score at least 60% correct on the multiple choice test, and then you have to write a good essay. Remember, there are two other videos on this channel. It's actually more than that. Um, there's two direct videos about SOL uh, essay prep. There's also a, a funny video just reminding you how to write a basic five paragraph essay. And I'll put some other materials together for you here over time. Um, but 60% minimum on the multiple choice test. The reason I remind you of that is if you get one wrong, you're like, I really don't know. Don't freak out. It's okay to get one wrong. It's okay to get a few wrong. What you need to do is make sure you don't get more than 40% wrong, okay? But if you're following these strategies, you've done appropriate preparation, you should probably be fine, okay? Remember, grammar-based questions, you always check the verbs first, follow those punctuation rules, okay? And then that overall process, you preview the passage, uh, you preview and annotate questions, you read and take some light notes on the passage, you keep the text and the questions together, keep it all organized, use process of elimination and Occam's razor when necessary. If you have to go back and reread, you reread in chunks of three, um, and then use uh, find the verbs first and use the eight punctuation rules. And that is it. Okay, now, that is the sort of how to take this multiple choice uh, writing as well test. If you have questions, remember you can reach out to me directly uh, at facebook.com slash Tibbins EST uh, on Twitter at Tibbins EST or email me Mr. Tibbins at yahoo.com. Uh, I hope that this video has been helpful to you. 
I hope that you feel confident as you take the test, and I hope you score really well and make the whole test look silly. We'd all love for these tests to go away, but until all the students are passing and make them look dumb, they're not going anywhere. So do your part and make the test look dumb. Good luck.